Garrett, uh, if you could tell me a bit more about about your business, where you are, what you're into, and we can dive, dive, go from there. Sure. So um, my business is called Plate Rate. We rate individual menu items at restaurants. So you can find the top rated dishes or drinks at a restaurant. And if you try any of the alcohol or the eight highest rated menu items, you get a 30% credit to order again from the business, which most people like because they want to try the best stuff at a restaurant um, and all the alcohol. And then um, if you uh, if it's your very first order from the restaurant, you get an extra 30%, which brings you up to 60% to try the alcohol and top rated menu items at a new restaurant. And that gets you coming back a second time. And then you get 30% to try new things on your third visit. That gets you coming back a third and fourth time. And then hopefully you'll be really loyal to that restaurant because they're more or less breaking even on the 30% incentives with the intent of creating loyalty with the consumer. And so it's a unique perspective on loyalty creation that um, you know should be much more effective than everything else in the industry. It's We're the only ones that do it in the world. Um, I invented that and um, uh, and in collaboration with team members and, um, you know, the uh, customers, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, but basically, um, you know, where we are now, we have a website, like a responsive website, which has far mm. too many features. And if I was going back to my younger self, I did the typical founder mistake of building too many features early on. I should have done more market research and, you know, landing page testing with individual features and see which ones would get traction before I actually went ahead and built them. And now I'm building the app that I should have built three years ago, which is an MVP that just has the things that are most frequently used by customers. And we will eventually get that other capability, those other capabilities back. But um, most of them weren't popular enough that we needed them in the MVP. And so we need to have a bigger team to be able to support such a large code base. Um, I just built too much too quickly. Um, you know, I was able to do it, but uh, I wasn't able to keep it bug free. And that doesn't work for a B2C app. It's got to be bug free or like be perceived as bug free. So that would be, um, you know, one of the things that I learned. If you want, I could go into like our current challenges. Would that be helpful as well? Yeah, yeah. Before you go to the current challenges, sure. Um, just for the sake of the people that are going to work that, just... How long have you been in business and um, how many employees you currently have and why are you located? So I'm in the greater New York City area um, in the New York City suburbs, um, but I go into the city regularly for um, for plate rate events and um, I host events in the city um, where we often order our food on plate rate. Um, I host this intellectual discussion groups with my not-for-profit and then um the team is about 15 full-time people in low-cost countries um, across a variety of um, continents, Asia, Africa, South America. Um, and uh, what was the other question you asked? Um, so greater out of New York, you're out of greater, greater New York City area. You have employees, 23 full-time employees. 15, 15 full-time. 15 full-time employees. Yeah. Okay. And how how long have you been in business? Oh yeah. So so there's another uh, thing that I did wrong when I started the company. I was worried about IP leaks and you know using offshore developers. So I only okay. recruited U.S. based equity developers. I offered them a ton of equity, but I found for the first three years I was doing play rate in my nights and weekends. Maybe first two years I was doing it in my nights and weekends. Two or three. And I made very little progress because the developers would stick around for two or three months. They would bring in their own tools. And then the next developers wouldn't like the tools that the first developers used. And so they would root out those tools and they were basically spinning wheels for two years and making very little progress. I got most of an MVP done of, you know, rating menu items and a couple of other features, but um, it took a really long time to do because of the high turnover of an equity-based team. I just didn't have people that were committed enough to sticking with it. They didn't have the tenacity or grit. Um, I was able to recruit a lot of people, but I wasn't able to retain them. So what I did, um, and interestingly, um, my only IP leak that I know that I can trace back that was not um, legal, um, I can't talk about too much, but um, I can say that um, it was from a person in the U.S., not from my offshore teams. So um, I have worked with offshore teams for uh, the last six years, and I made a lot more progress working with offshore teams than I did working with onshore teams for equity. 
Yeah, thank you for that. There's a point that you made, and I think it's going to be really beneficial to our audience. You said recruit, but not able to retain. Can yes. you tell me what the issue was there? Well, people just, they didn't have the um, tenacity to stick with a company until it became successful. You know, like I, I have thought about giving up plate rate probably a dozen times in the last, you know, nine years. And I said, maybe I shouldn't be doing this, right? But 99% of the time, I'm like, this is exactly what I should be doing. And I'm ready to move forward. And we're moving forward. And we've made progress all of that time. But we've made slower progress than I would have if I had B2C experience. You know, there were a lot of growing pains for not knowing B2C. That's another thing I would change. If I, I had 10 business ideas when I started Plate Rate. Nine of them were B2B. And I said, oh, let me try the B2C one because I've never done that before and I'll just figure it out real quick. Well, it turned out to be a lot harder to figure out B2C UX when I had no one teaching me. All in my career, I was working for Fortune 500 companies. You know, I worked at GE, I worked at Citigroup, I worked at Oppenheimer Funds, you know, like major companies that had experts in whatever I needed. And I could always go to the expert and I did. And I asked lots of questions and I became an expert myself quickly. But when you have your own company, you don't have those experts to rely on. So I learned through the School of Hard Knocks, which is a lot more of an expensive school than the School of Expert Fortune 500, you know, 20, 30, 40 year tenure employees who have all the knowledge in the world at their fingertips at the tip of their tongue. Um, I didn't have access to that and I didn't have the money to hire the consultants that had that. So because I'm bootstrapped. And so it was, you know, everything has gone much slower for that reason. Um, because B2C UX is a, a bear. It's, you know, it's hard. Um, and I think our current website is okay, but it's not where it needs to be. And our app coming out, I hope is much closer to where it needs to be. But I think we still are going to have improvements. We're going to keep making improvements until um, people say that we're better than all of the competition. And that's, that's what we're striving for. Yeah. And that's interesting. It's an interesting point that you made because we have, we have, we have the same background in terms of working for corporate America. One of the things that challenges that I, things that I took for granted was the systems that we had in place in corporate America, right? Yeah. And I thought that if I had my own company, so far as I recruited good people, they were going to be able to get the job done. But there was no way that they were getting the job done because there were no systems in place, right? So when I went for KPMG and the big consulting companies, right? You know, we work in the, you know, of course, it's the brightest people. However, the systems was something that I've always used, for, I've always been used to. And to the extent that I even didn't pay attention to that. To that. Yeah. How much of those did you realize coming in, in your first year as a business owner, realizing that now I'm not going into a company as GE, Garrett from GE. I'm going into a company as Gary from Pallet Ray, yeah. what was the difference? Oh, I mean, people treat process. you very differently, right? I, you know, I, yeah. you don't get much respect as a small business owner, <laughs> and I'm okay with that. <laughs> I'm, I'm not an ego driven guy, so, um, like I care more about doing the right thing for people than I do about being seen as, you know, the man or whatever, like someone with influence and authority. Um, I'm more of a, uh, lead with compassion, not with influence and authority. Um, at least that's my goal. Um, but you're right about the processes, but for me, like my natural tendency, I, I like to say I eat chaos and spit out order. And so I'm a natural person that takes the chaos of a small company and puts processes in place. And I'm constantly changing those processes to tweak them and make them better. But that's like my natural, you know, and, and you're right, like big companies have good processes in place. That's part of what I learned at GE is process mapping and process improvement and how to take a process that's broken and fix it. Because we always said, if you automate a broken process, you make more problems faster. And so you want to fix the process before you automate it. And so that's what I've naturally done in my career. I try to create, you know, efficient processes and then automate them. And then you end up with something brilliant. Um, unfortunately that's not how most software is done. It's they automate it and then it's broken and they have to try to fix it and it doesn't work very well in that direction. So, um, for me, the processes were great in terms of like having that, you know, I'm six Sigma trained black belt, black belt trained six, uh, six Sigma certified. And, um, 
and so that was all very helpful. You know, I did lean, uh, lean workouts and, um, that was all really helpful when I, you know, doubled the operating margin at, um, market share, um, when they asked me to improve profitability, you know, I took a two month process and brought it down to two weeks, a uh, two month implementation process. And so, um, you're right though, the processes are key. And that's what we used to say at GE is there aren't people, there aren't bad people. There are just bad processes. And if you have a good <laughs> process, even a mediocre person can do a great job. You exactly. need good processes in place, though. That, that, that yes, that's absolutely right. Excellent point. So, question for you, and I think this is always what people that have studied their business coming out of corporate America. So, one of the things that I said to myself was, "I want to have my own business." It took me a couple of years to realize I was self-employed, right? So. The difference between being self-employed and having your own businesses. Self-employment, you're not there, the business doesn't work. You need to be there to work. All you've done is created a job for yourself. Having the business is, and our definition of a business in action coach is a profitable commercial enterprise that works without you. Profitable and work without you. If you don't have those two, you don't have a business. In your view, do you think your company has been there yet where if I say, hey, Garrett, you know, just, you know, go to vacation in the Caribbean for three months. What do you think is going to happen to your company? No, it, the company wouldn't. I mean, look, th there there are people that I could put in charge if I wanted to, if I had to take a medical leave of absence or something like that for some reason. Um, I don't think it would make the same progress as it will with me. It's still dependent on me. But I think, you know, three to five years from now, I think we'll be profitable and it'll work without me. And in fact, I may not still be running it. I don't need to run the business forever. That's not, that's not my, you know, I, I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur. Um, and I want to be able to help steer the direction of the company, but I don't have to be the the president all the time um, as the company grows. And there will probably be a time where I don't want to be anymore. Um, but right now, you know, the company needs me to be that. And so I enjoy being it. Um, I'm just saying like, I'm not tied to it. So someday that may change. Um, but you know, for me, it's what you said is exactly what I'm striving for is profitable and it can work without me. And then I would move on to another part of the business or another business entirely because I want to be a serial entrepreneur, you know, for the rest of my life, I want to build valuable businesses that add. And I don't know if you, um, looked up any of my YouTube videos, but you know, I, I promote what I call generous capitalism. And what I want to do is yeah. build a number of generous businesses that show that putting customers, vendors, and employees before the company itself is a winning strategy and will help you win so much market share that you end up being more profitable, even though your margins are lower, but taking less margin and giving it away to everybody you work with. I want to prove that that's a winning strategy in the free markets. And if I can create a trend that shows that generous capitalism is what I advocate for is the winning strategy in capitalism, I think we can get away from what I call greedy capitalism, which is where we are now, where the company takes everything it can for itself and maximizes its profit. I want to do something very different. And there are a few companies doing that. You know, Costco is a company that does that. There are a couple of others. Um, yeah. And so I want to do that and I want to inspire other entrepreneurs to do that to bring about the, what I think is the final stage of capitalism, which is generous capitalism. I think a lot of people are anti-capitalist right now because greedy capitalism is getting so greedy and there's so big of a socioeconomic disparity between the top of the top. You know, it's not even the top 1%. It's the top 1% of the top 1% who get 80% of the top 1%'s income. So you have this infinitesimally small percentage of the population getting almost all of the economic growth. And is that fair? I mean, I don't think it's fair. Who could possibly think that's fair other than the people who are getting all that wealth and think I deserve all of this because I'm amazing and they are amazing, but share it. Like, you know, I like the book, <laughs> everything you need to know you learned in kindergarten, right? Share your toys. Like <laughs> you don't need all that as toys for yourself. Truth is after a hundred thousand dollars, more money either doesn't make you any happier or it only makes you happier logarithmic to the amount of money you increase. So statistically it's not very significant to get more money you know you're not getting happier having more money after 100k a year and all of these people are way above that they're probably at 50 million a year so anyway i talk too much sorry no no that, that's great it's great it's great insights and i really appreciate that 
I'm going to ask you one more question and I'm going to let you further expand on yeah. any challenges that we've just spoken about. So you did mention that maybe the next couple of years, three years, you're going to be in a position where the company may run without you. What is happening now and what do you think is going to happen there? And if you could walk me a little bit of a synopsis on the pathway from now to there, what is going to change for that to happen? So I want to get to a point where we spread virally, you know, and I think we have the innovation to spread virally. We need the user experience to spread virally, and we need to make sure that we're listening carefully to our customers to understand what will make them spread us virally. When I talk with a customer and I explain what we're about, they love it. And they're like, oh, I need to share this with people, but we need to tell our story through the UX and through the experience in a way that is just like naturally makes someone pick it up because no one wants to read a story. They just need to, it just needs to be intuitive in their experience and a part of their natural process. And so we need to really create stickiness in the app so that people come to us and stay with us and with our restaurants more importantly, because that's what we want to promote is the profitability of the restaurants. And so we want to make sure that people are going to the restaurants on plate rate and coming back to them over and over again and ordering on plate rate because that's how we make money. But the interesting part is we don't cost anyone anything. Like we have a unique business model where no one really pays for us. It's like a such a good win-win business model. And I don't talk about the details of how we manage to make money when no one pays for us, but we do have a way of doing that. And um, that's part of our competitive advantage. Okay, that's interesting. Um, so any other... I know there's a few challenges. So the younger, the younger version of Gary, what would you do differently, knowing what you know now and where you are now? Um, well, I mentioned a couple of things. Right, is don't don't build so many features and do more market research on the features. Don't try to rely on equity based U.S. developers. That was a failing strategy. Um, and you know, don't try to compete head to head with our competitors. Um, and I don't, I don't even consider Uber, DoorDash, and Grubhub to be competitors at this point because they're really more marketing engines, and that's not that's not the place that we play. We're really the restaurant's ordering system. We want to be the partner of the restaurant, the way that the restaurant wants people to order from. We're not really a marketing engine per se, although we do do a little bit of marketing for restaurants. And we do it differently than than our competitors because you're not going to beat someone with a billion dollars at a marketing game um, when you're a bootstrap startup. So you have to be a little bit different. And so we are, and we have a different niche. Um, so I would say if I had found that earlier, it would have helped. Um, I struggled a long time trying to compete with Uber Eats, DoorDash and Grubhub directly with marketing, and that was not a winning strategy. So um, I wasted some, some time and money uh, trying to do that. But and I don't want to say wasted, but I, you know, it was a little inefficient, but it's, it's it was process. also what I needed to do to learn. Right. And so it's part of the path. And so while the younger Garrett would do something different, if I could time travel, I haven't figured time travel out yet. So give me 10 years for time travel. Um, so, um, but yeah, uh, you know, that that's what I would do differently if I could time travel. Nana. Oh, OK. How, how many hours do you work a week? Um, always over um, 80, average. often over a hundred, um, you know, a week? I, yeah, a week. Yeah. So and I pretty much, if that? I'm not taking care of my kids from when I wake up to when I go to sleep, I'm either taking care of my kids. I do do some socializing and like I said, my not-for-profit events, but those are really work events. So, you know, I would count some of that as work events. And, um, you know, when I'm driving into the city, I take work calls. Um, I, I do personal calls too and call friends, but um, pretty much if I'm awake and I'm not with my family or at a, an event, then I'm working. So seven days a week. How, how do you feel about I, I guess I've taken this past year uh, in 2023 and 2024, I've taken six days that I didn't work out of the last six years. Those are the only six days that I've actually taken off, including Christmas, holidays, Thanksgiving, you know, I'm very driven. Like I want to make this business successful and I will do whatever I have to, to make it successful. And I want to make people who help the company grow a lot of money, you know, not a little money, but a lot of money. And I have no problems sharing the money that I make with the people that I work with. And I don't expect anyone to work my hours. My whole team knows that no one tries to keep up with me. They're not going to be able to, but um, you know, for me, the secret is 
sleep enough. And when I'm tired, I, I sleep. And, you know, I, when I'm not, you know, this morning I woke up at three o'clock ready to go. And so I started working. So if money wasn't an issue, the business was running, you had all this time that has come to you now, what would you do with it? What would you do differently? If I had a lot of time and the business was profitable and could run without me? Yeah. I'd start another business. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I have okay. I have a list of, no joke, 50 businesses I want to start. And I have a lot of ideas that I want to put into those businesses. Everyone has a unique, innovative twist on the industry that'll be disruptive. And, you know, no one has seen any of that. But um, eventually, I want to build those businesses and create teams of people that I built, you know, built this network up of um, to create teams of people to start the new businesses and then let the the more mature business run it, you know, run its course and be the thing that funds the new business. So the old business will invest in the new businesses. Okay. Now, now about to be you, honest, what do you like, like to do? I'm going to be in hospitality for quite a while. So even when I say, new okay. business, <laughs> you know, it's probably going to be new businesses and hospitality for quite a while mm. until, until I've kind of really dominated um, the space, which, you know, give that five to 10 years is my guess. So talk to me about your hobbies. What do you like to do outside of? I know you're working all the time, but yeah, I do work a lot, right? but I do have hobbies. Um, you know, I like wine, so I have wine buddies. I'm starting a wine club with one of my wine friends in my my town, and uh, I do wine tasting events um, with my not for profit and with Plate Rate, where we order on Plate Rate. And um, my my major hobby is actually practical philosophy which is about living a happier life and preventing harm in the world. And that's what my not-for-profit is about is to, um, there's sort of two steps to it. Um, well, there's five, which we call the five intentions, which are things that we should all be intending to do all the time. The North star is to be the best version of ourselves, to seek truth and to be fair. And when I say be fair, what I mean is prevent all significant unnecessary harm um, because I don't think any human being should be exposed to significant harm that's not necessary. Um, and then two, increase happiness and decrease harm. And I would argue that those are morals that or ethics that pretty much any reasonable person would agree with, and we should all be striving for. And if we can work together towards those goals, which I'm trying to create a community of people who works together towards those goals in my not-for-profit. Um, and it also includes the second intention, which is transparently sharing your beliefs and listening with an open mind to other people's beliefs. And then the third intention is critical thinking skills so you can better discern fact from fiction and wisdom from folly. It's a lot of fake news going around and the fake news travels faster than real news. So right now the truth is at risk and people's understanding of the truth is at risk because they lack the critical thinking skills to know fact from fiction. And with AI, it's only gonna get worse because you can make fake videos soon with Sora that will seem like they're real videos that some, you know, internet person decides they have a political bias and they want to lie, cheat and steal to get their way, they're going to make fake videos to make it seem like their political aspirations are, you know, the right thing to follow, even though it's actually all fake. And the problem is people don't have the critical thinking skills to discern back from fiction. Um, and when something like Sora gets out, then it's going to be even harder. Amazing. Excellent. I think I see for lunch, you know, being an excellent philanthropist, we need to we, we need to get some of that time in your business back so you can it can really impact your knowledge on 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 you know a lot of people um, the way that your thought process is about life in general about thinking you know it, it's amazing. And Thank you. I you know I would love to invite you if you're open to it. I'd love to add you to yeah. our New York City events so you could come. Yeah, um, we have definitely. great conversations about really intellectually interesting things. I think you would enjoy them. We talk about everything Definitely. from morality to politics to, you know, the meaning of life to free will to like just intellectually interesting topics that, you know, most of which have a practical bent, but not all of which have a practical bent. Um, I like practical I'll, philosophy I'll, I'll because that. it's not practical. What's yeah. the point? But um, sometimes something that seems like it's not practical, like whether or not we have free will has practical implications, um, because if you believe we have free will, then you adopt a growth mindset and you try to be the best version of yourself and suddenly you're more influential and you're improving yourself 
and now you can do more than you were able to before because of your belief in free will. And my my event on Tuesday is going to talk about the strength of the will and how not only do we have free will, but it's actually, I think, more influential than nature and nurture on our lives. That, that's excellent. I love to be part of that and also have a mastermind group that I'll, I'll really love it to be part of. Um, so definitely, you know, that in terms of you know, next steps, um, I'm going to look forward to the event. I currently out in the country, I'm visiting Europe and, and Africa. Oh. Um, I'm going to come back on the 14th. So, and that's one of the things that I've started really doing. And that's why I love what you're talking about. It's not to be caught in my own little world, but, you know, just to sort of come here and understand various aspects in how people are living and try to understand why they're living that way. Right. And, and it's all about, and when, one of the things that I really appreciate about Action Coach, and I know you're going to love some of those courses that we take, right? You know, somebody who likes uh, in terms of the, the mental aspect of business, right? Is is something we call the point of power, right? So it's, it's, it's below the point and above the point. So below the point is something that we call, you know, blame, excuses, denial, right? So meaning that, you know, people that are always blaming somebody for something, it's, they're always under denial, right? It's always under blame. They, they're actually powerless, right? What other thing they're powerful? And over its own, you know, ownership, accountability, right? Meaning that if you say, hey, you know what? Yeah, this is this is what I, this is my fault. I'm going to fix it. It makes you powerful, right? Okay. Whereas it puts you above that point of power. So I would love to come and share some of those things with your group. In that would be great. And if you that, want to talk, if and that, you don't, if you want to talk and present at the group, you could come up with a topic that you want to present. I think that's great. Yeah, like, yeah, trying to combat it. blame, excuse, and denial is so important because people will often deny that they are the root cause of their own problems. And you know, they when I try to point out, hey, what a, what about maybe thinking about this a different way and being more positive instead of constantly yeah. thinking about the negative? They go, no, yeah. no, no, that's not right. Like everything's really horrible. And and I'm like, the reason okay. things are horrible is because you're always <laughs> seeing the negative side of everything. And, you know, instead of looking at the positive side of things and people don't realize that a positive mentality really can drastically change your life and taking accountability without beating yourself up, right? There, you don't have to beat yourself yeah. up from mistakes. You just have to learn yeah. from them and say, hey, what went yeah. wrong? Be honest about it and don't yeah. be in denial and accept it and say, yeah. look, this is the mistake I made, own it. And then improve from it, and learn from it, improve and grow it. from it. And, and one of the things that it ties in perfectly is one concept that we call the identity iceberg. So people see the iceberg; the only thing that they see is on top. But what really starts the formation is the bottom, which is called by its environment. You know, it's it's culture. Like there's so many. That's where the real formation is, right? So people are saying certain things, and if you don't really understand what the iceberg beneath this is, right, you just go look on top. Right. So I had a client, you know, within my culture course, and they were always like trying to speak up about everybody, right? And like, I gotta do this, I gotta do this. And I'm like, why do you always feel like you always want to do that? And you know, got the fact though that they grew up is their dad is like, you gotta do better. So they're always beating down on the mentally that you are not the best, you're not the best. So all her life, she's been trying to prove that she's the best. Right. Right. So subconsciously, anytime that she gets in the environment, if she's not the one who's the loudest, she's not being at the best, right? So those are the dynamics that I love to, you know, you know, explore more. And I totally really enjoy this interview, Garrett. I'm really looking forward to, you know, really forming a great partnership with you in terms of what you do, sharing some ideas with you from both my end, you know, as a coach, both from your end and what you do. After some of your events, talk about some of these things and further share some of the stuff that I'm doing. Uh, that would be amazing. Awesome. Um, yeah, I would love to uh, have you at some of the events. And, you know, what you just said reminded me of a conversation I had with my kids because they were competing with each other and each trying to win. And I said, girls, you know, I have twin daughters that are about to turn seven. And I'm like, girls, it doesn't yeah. matter whether you win or lose. You just need to do your best. And I have a saying yes. for them, uh, for everybody, which is do your best and accept the rest. If you've done your best, yes. You can't do better than that. So just do your best and then let it rest. You know, do your best and, yeah. and then whatever comes, that's and, and, and that's And, and be, be the best and do their best because I realized that 
my, you know, I play sports. So one of the things that happens when you play sports, and I try to put my kids into it, is there are a lot of things that you learn that life itself kind of teach you, right? Sometimes. So, you know, also like my son played that and they did track and field. So anytime I realize one thing, like my, my, my son, my younger one, and when he was five or six years old, um, I realized that he liked, he didn't like track and field, but he liked playing soccer. And I'm like, why don't you like track and field, like playing soccer? Because like, because when I step on the track and field, so you come out, starting to run, and you'll be crying, literally. I'm like, why are you crying? And he realized that the fear of losing just got to him. But in soccer, he's surrounded with everybody. So if the ball goes to the net, it's not just him, right? So those are the things that you, you got to realize that you learn so much about them, you learn so much about the personality and try to, you know, give them a level of confidence. And we know we can go on and on about these things and definitely totally. want to be...